All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so thank you for coming to the presentation. I hope you get something out of it. But as always, I am open to feedback as I'm talking. Questions are good. A lot of you here are much more knowledgeable than me. So please help me find the right way. And we are an open source company, Yada DB. So if you see a flaw in something I'm doing, prove me wrong, do it better, and send a merge request. All right? OK. So what we're going to do uh, is First, I'm going to have a very quick once over of what SQL is. I don't know, I kind of assumed people would know, but I didn't want to gamble too much on it. So we're going to very quickly go over that. We're going to talk about why you would use NoSQL and why you would go back to SQL. All right, and then we're going to talk about how we SQL with YadaDB. Uh, for those who don't know, YadaDB is a hierarchical key value store. It's a NoSQL database, although we're adding SQL, so we need a new name. We're going with not only. SQL, maybe? We're working on it. All right, so we're going to talk about how we map a uh, relatively free-form schema to a relational thing that has a lot more rules to it. Um, <clears throat> first, quick, what is SQL? It's a structured query language. It's a way of asking the computer to get data for you. It's instead of focusing on what you, uh, or how you get the data, it focuses on, I'm sorry, you focus on what data you want. It focuses on how to get the data. Welcome. All right, it's a very common standard. I think everybody started SQL in this room, right? Uh, when MongoDB took off, we started to move back away from it, and we are going to see that flip around. All right, um, for those who don't know, SQL is usually used for relational databases, which is where you say you have tables A and B, and they're related to each other through some key. Uh, and the way you normalize your data is making sure that it's all distributed across tables and the keys are aligned properly. And there's a whole other talk on that that I didn't get to go to, which makes me very sad. So I'm going to assume we can skip that. Major SQL vendors, and I'm sure you've all heard of, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, My, uh, MS SQL. Well, uh, most SQL implementations more or less follow a standard. SQL 92 is one we aim to be compatible with. We are long term hoping to become Postgres. Uh, and be a drop-in compatible with their SQL syntax and unique caveats, although they're much more standards-oriented than some of these other ones. Um, however, you know, as long as you're a mainstream SQL engine, you pretty much behave as people would expect. All right, the key things to know about SQL, and there is a lot to it, a lot more than I have up here, but the most important ones that I'm focusing on for now are select, insert, delete, and update, the CRUD operations. Um, the most interesting is the select, right? And then following that, probably the, in, the update and the delete, because you still have some conditions that can go into those. But select has, the, has a bit of special gunk to it, especially this join part. Uh, I'm sorry, the from point, uh, which can be a table, a view, a join statement, or a, another select statement. It can be many things. Um, and then you also have the things you're selecting, the condition and some group by and a group by condition and then an order by clause, right? And this should all be pretty understandable. Um, joins is how you have the relational aspects of a relational database. The most simple thing we can do is a cross join, which is where you take two tables and you pair this row with that row, this row with every row in that table and the next row with every row in that table. So you end up with m times n rows. And then usually what you do is you apply some uh, conditions to them to get the other join types. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation and how Octo or uh, YadaDB does the joining in a performing way. OK? In addition to the natural inner joins and cross joins, we have the outer joins. They're a little bit more interesting. Um, Left, right, they're, they're all outer joins. Uh, basically, they fetch all the data from here and try to pair it up with the data on the other table. But if that data is not available, it puts in some nulls. Right? Um, they often use, or they're described in a lot of literature in, in terms of set operations. Um, and that's a typo. It should be union intersect and uh, not difference. Uh, except, except, minus. thank you, minus. I like yeah, one of those. All right, uh, the where condition, uh, it's a Boolean expression. 
Uh, SQL has a bunch of operands and operators, kind of what you'd expect. Arithmetic works the way you'd expect. Thank you to the grammar for having that in there. Um, you can have additional subqueries in your Boolean expression. So you could say like we're value in select star from other table. So you can get uh, recursive entries, if you will. And I believe there are some SQL implementations which are Turing complete, which make it all kinds of fun. So uh, to summarize that whole section, SQL, it's a way of declaratively declaring what you want and letting the computer figure out how to get it. It handles all the logic of storing the stuff on disk, of retrieving it from disk, and of putting it in a format you can handle. One thing it does that's very important is if you give it a Boolean condition, there are optimizations you can do. So you don't iterate through every row in the table to select one row that has like the first name Charles. Uh, that problem where we do the optimization of ordering the joins, of uh, selecting which equijoin optimizations to pick, uh, which is first name equals Charles, that's hard. As it turns out, that is an NP hard problem. And uh, yeah, that one's rough usually. Well, we'll talk about it in a minute. All right, so NoSQL um, just means no SQL. You don't use SQL to access the database. You usually have an API specific to the language that you use to talk to it. Some examples, which probably everybody's heard of, except, well, YadaDB, uh, which is our product. It's a NoSQL hierarchical key value store. We have APIs currently in Rust, Go, C, M, Perl, JavaScript, up and coming Python, and Java. And then after that, we target the next. Node.js? Yep, yeah, we have Node.js. I said JavaScript, sorry. Uh, okay. That was not made by us. That's yeah. actually community <laughs> members, which is really exciting. We would love to have more of a community involved in developing these wrappers. We want them to be as very ergonomic for the language you're using it in. So if you're an expert in a language and you wanted to help us with a wrapper, please reach out. Uh, we had somebody who suggested he wanted common lisp. I don't know how high in demand that is, but. All right, so the benefits of NoSQL. Um, oh, oh, hold on, I forgot about a slide here. Okay, so one of the caveats about NoSQL is it's not a uniform data store. So things tend to get stored um, not just as a series of tables and columns, but in its own unique fashion. So nowadays you have some graph databases, you have logical databases, you have us for a hierarchical key value store, you have Redis, which is just a key value store. Mongo uses JSON and Bison to store things, Bison rather, sorry. And as such, designing the schema for each of these databases is a little bit unique, and you have to kind of understand the performance implications of the design that you're picking. Um, and it's a lot different than when you talk about designing a relational database that you would use with SQL. So there's benefits and perks to that. Um, let's skip over that for a moment. One of the benefits is you tend to get a lot more performance for the cases that the databases do well at. Right, so as an example, YadaDB does very, very well uh, in time series data. So it does wonderfully if you're doing uh, banking or if you're doing certain kinds of healthcare, right? You also have control over how the data gets fetched from the database, which allows you to use meta knowledge about what, what's going on uh, to better select how you do things. So stepping back, uh, I put an example here. Please excuse my silliness. Um, Got an EB, we store things as a series of keys and values. Each key can have a value and it can have additional keys. So the example I have here, I have a key people, and then a key Sanchez, Rick, and whether or not he's alive, and then a question mark. Um, yeah, I don't know, we'll get to that in a minute. So this is very good for data in which there's a hierarchy we can use. Uh, MongoDB as a contrast, is kind of the same way you store documents, right, as JSON stores. Here, your documents are less explicit. They're just subscripts on the same key. So Mongo can easily map into a YadaDB database. Turns out you can't easily go the other way, but that's a problem for another day. Uh, schema definitions in NoSQL databases are uh, free form, right? So, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a little bit easier for initial development, but it also means that you have to pray you have documentation somewhere because otherwise there is no indication of what fields are available in each object, in each dictionary, or in each uh, hierarchy of your keys, or whatever. 
So you'd have to like go through your database and examine everything to see what's available, and that's painful. <laughs> um, however, it does allow you to easily add things into the schema, which is helpful for doing initial development. Uh, less of an issue these days with small databases if you do migrations. Still, you know. And then the other big difference is that uh, we store data differently than databases. And this is where we kind of reach the edge of my knowledge for things like Postgres. So people are welcome to jump in. But my understanding with Postgres is that they store it in a format called Toast, and it's literally rows of data on disk, whereas we store it as a B star tree, and you go through a block looking for your key, and then you get the value. So we don't have a fixed sized row size, which means if your data isn't necessarily uniform, you don't waste all this space in the row putting it onto disk, you just put what you need. Right? And the other thing, one of the reasons we're really good at time series is we have key compression. So if you store uh, a number, you only have to store the number that changed, which means when you go to add a new integer to the database, you're adding maybe a few bytes and then the value. Right? So it's very, very little. Um, and of course, you know, one of, well, not of course, but one of the really good things about NoSQL databases or about YadaDB specifically is because we have more control over what data gets accessed, it reduces the scope of our transactions so we can do transaction processing very, very quickly. Right? It's uh, a little bit more straightforward and it's, you know, faster at least for what we use it for. However, uh, there's disadvantages. So, some of the reasons you might pick SQL, right? It's uh, everybody knows SQL. There's a clear separation of concerns. The person making the database, they are the ones responsible for making the database go fast. The person using the database, I guess, kind of sort of needs to know not to do a whole lot of outer joins, but um, you know they can focus on making their application work, and we can focus on making the database work, and it's a very clear cut thing. Another big, big advantage is SQL. The interface is well defined. We have ODBC drivers. We have JDBC drivers. We have uh, in Go a driver interface package defined by the language itself. So adding or switching out your database is much easier. Not to say super easy, but much easier. It's relatively uniform. And so as, as it's more uniform, what we see is a great deal of tooling ecosystem surrounding SQL. This is really why you use SQL. There are tools in SQL that just don't exist for non-SQL databases. And when we start doing data warehousing or large-scale analytics, we start to encounter difficulty in using something like YadaDB or Mongo, right? Business intelligence is a thing these days. Um, and yeah, this, this is important, as it turns out. So what we want to do, you know, all right. Yeah, what we want to do is be able to do the NoSQL and do the SQL at the same time. So on your production system, you have the fast the benefits production performance for NoSQL, and for your analytics, you can do SQL. Now, what's interesting is uh, there's a site called redbook.io, which has a bunch of really good database papers. I do encourage people to go there and read. Um, they have a section on query optimization. And in that section, we have an author who is quite confident about what they're saying. And they saw the rise of NoSQL and they go, you know what? We're going to need SQL for these NoSQL engines. They got it right. And uh, they're now, now they're shooting, shooting shots here. And they're uh, yelling at us NoSQL people for using 1980s years optimizers in 2010, 2020. So we got to show them what's what and read their books and then steal all their notes. Mm -hmm. All right, so YadaDB, we want SQL access. We want to make it available to our customers. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, our customers have existing databases, which are quite large. Uh, we have some legacy customers who are running healthcare systems on a large scale, and they need to be able to query those large-scale healthcare systems. Um, so we need a way of mapping their existing schema into a relational database, and their schemas are not relational. Their schemas are all over the place. Does anybody know a product called Vista? Um, it's a healthcare system created by the uh, Veterans Affairs of the United States government, and it's used all over the place. It's, it's a beast. Uh, 
So we are developing a project called Octo. The goal is to allow SQL engine access to YadaDB data stores. We are not released yet, we're not finished. Uh, we have some people testing us out and they are very excited, but uh, you can still pretty easily get a seg fault. So please be gentle as you go and fix the code. All right, uh, it's written in C and we are of course open to talking to people and getting contributions, whether it's in the form of beta testers, source code, documentation suggestions, whatever. Please shoot us a message, talk to us, all right? Um, we have a few things in YadaDB itself which we consider an advantage compared to traditional systems. Specifically, uh, what we have is a language that we support called M, which allows us to compile queries down to object code. And this is very much like what Postgres added in recent versions where they're using LLVM for certain types of queries. And I don't know the details of how that works. If there's a Postgres expert in the room, correct me or whatever. Okay. Uh, hmm? In a version, there was just, there was just a talk about how version 11 uses LLVM to compile. Yep. JIT compile. Yep. So I guess it's fast if you use version 11. Yeah, so that's. Well, I think they're only doing it in some cases, unless I'm mistaken. So a lot of the, the more recent literature is about using um, apps, like class abstractions and then compiling that down to bytecode to generate your execution plan. Uh, what we do is generate our M code and compile that down to object code and execute it. It's a little bit different than the literature because we're not using object-oriented programming for it, but it's like using LLVM and Postgres, except we do it for everything, for better or for worse. Uh, so, let's talk about how to SQL. Any questions on anything so far? I know I moved kind of fast, but I think a lot of that, judging by the looks in here, is kind of, uh, I don't know. Okay, so, um, Octo uh, has a bunch of different phases that we go through. We start by getting the query. Uh, right now, we can get it from either the terminal or we have a Postgres SQL, a Postgres server wire protocol implementation thing that we are uh, developing. Gotta say, Postgres guys, you did a wonderful job with your documentation. Implementing that protocol based on the documentation was very straightforward. They did a great job. Uh, so we can connect to uh, Octo using SQL, uh, using the PG driver in, in Go. We can connect to it using uh, JDBC drivers so you can get like Squirrel SQL working or SQL Workbench or whatever your favorite thing is. We have some people who are even trying to get Microsoft products to connect to it and having surprisingly some degree of success, which is wonderful, but all the same. So we get the input query. That's the first stage. That's a whole different mess. I'm not going to talk about that today. All right. We enter uh, the parser, and as I think I mentioned earlier in the pre-discussion, the parser is a, a, a bison yak parser. So it uses a uh, normalized grammar for the SQL language, a uh, form of the BNF that I made some alterations to so that it didn't have as many reduce, reduce conflicts and things like that. Uh, then, depending on what type of query we have, after we do the initial parsing, we either go into create table, select, um, insert, update, delete. Not all of these things are implemented yet, uh, mostly because, and they won't be for version one, as an example for insert, because inserting into a schema which is already existed, sorry, which is al already exists and has its own set of rules, we have to somehow pass it to the existing application to determine whether or not the rules, it, it fits the rules and the data can be accepted. So there's a whole nother layer of complexity there that we're not ready to handle yet. So the current use is you insert data to YadaDB using our API, and when you're doing complicated analytics, you pull the data out. Right. So the more interesting one is select. The first thing we do is generate a logical plan, um, which roughly corresponds to how the data will get iterated through, how the uh, keys will be fixed for certain types of optimizations. Somebody looks very, very confused. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so we're going to populate the logical plan, and then we optimize the logical plan. This is where we actually, for now, choose the orderings of the SQL statements. I'm sorry, the ordering of the joins. Eventually, there's a chance that will move more into the physical plan execution. 
Uh, one of the benefits is that our, our physical plans are source files, so we have some degree of freedom there. Uh, we don't know how much of the reasoning we can move there without really making things kind of fishy. Uh, so optimize the logical plan, then we generate a physical plan, and this is a, a C data structure that corresponds very closely with the source files that we actually generate. So it's a very thin wrapping, and then the actual uh, physical plan emission, we kind of just translate it to N and print stuff out. Then we put that into a buffer, we compile it, we execute it, and we return the results. Uh, and again, that varies depending on how you're connecting to us currently. Uh, uh, the Postgres driver, PSQL, we send it across the network for you, or you use our Octa executable and we just display it to the terminal. Uh, any questions on the picture? So can you explain a little yeah. bit more about this M? Okay. Um, so M is a programming language which we support, originally created in the 1980s. All right, so YadaDB has some history, it has some lineage. We are forked from a project called GTM, which is Greystone Technology Mumps. Uh, and Mumps is a language that has a very close association between the programming language itself and the data storage. So as an example, you would do, it, it, the general syntax is command and then like arguments. So you would do like set and then caret value equals, or caret key equals value, and that will persist it to disk. And this format, uh, this, this way of writing the code was very popular in the 1980s and we wrote a lot of applications in it that are still in production today, including um, Vista, which is an open source EHR system, a few proprietary EHR systems that you know, run several large databases, some very large financial systems and, and whatnot. Um, and the problem that we have here is now everybody has this M code, which there's language things that aren't quite what you'd expect from a language in 2019, but it's very, very fast. And so they can't easily get off of it because it's, there's nothing to replace it. And that's what Yada be, Yada DB is trying to expose the fast parts, which are the database, to other languages. <coughs> that's the, the principle of what we're doing. So we're utilizing it because we know that our compiler for it is fast. We also know it's available on every system YadaDB is installed. Um, and I can show you some mumps, or M, if you'd like. But why don't we wait a little while for that? <coughs> Anything else? That was a good question. OK. Um, so the three phases that we're really interested in, um, the parsing of the expressions, the initial optimization pass, and then the physical planning. So what we're going to talk about today is really uh, kind of all three. What I'm going to do is give a SQL expression and then talk about how we might represent it in a general free form language that's not mumps, but mumps-esque. And you know, we're going to get a good understanding of how to connect these things. Um, yeah. <sighs> So after we compile them, I, I should mention, right now one of the things we haven't done, which is on our list, is everything is executed serial, ser, serially on a single process. Uh, eventually, what we would like to do is launch multiple processes to work on different parts of the query at the same time. There's some stuff to figure out there in terms of handling the uh, propagation of keys for merging and for, anyway, we'll get there. So let's take the thing we talked about earlier, although I changed it by accident, I do apologize. Uh, we're gonna look at a key. We're gonna look at a database schema where we have a list of people organized by last name, first name, and then whether they're alive or dead, okay? Uh, how do we represent that as a relational schema? Well, the easiest thing we can do is create a table called people. First name, we're just gonna make it a var char. And then this key num zero, I'm sorry, isn't a SQL standard, I'm a bad person. You only need this if you're mapping to an existing MUMPS database. If you're creating a new database, uh, you don't need that. It's optional. Hopefully it doesn't break anything. Uh, <laughs> and it says that this 
This variable is actually the first part of this subscript right here. All right? And you say your last name is kenum one and that's saying it's this part. And then we have our actual value, a live bar chart. Now, we added a lot of things here to overload or provide a lot of control over how these things get fetched from disk uh, or from the database. So you can actually embed M code in parts of this to tell us how to fetch the value from the data store. So the uh, connecting stuff between SQL and between our, our data store is very much in control of the user. As an example, you could add a uh, extract statement where you can pretty much just write M code, we'll replace the special keyword keys, open parens, name of key, with how we actually fetch that key, which can vary depending on the situation, and then run it. Um, we know it's relatively robust, this, this mechanism. We've successfully mapped pretty large schemas into it. Um, and, you know, sorry. Don't yell at me too bad about the non-standard SQL stuff. All right. Uh, so YadaDB provides us with, with three basic operations. Uh, we can fetch data. Data is stored in a sorted fashion. We can iterate over the data that is stored in a sorted fashion. And we can store data. Those are the three guarantees we have. And I have a hypothesis that any database implementing these three features should more or less be able to use similar approaches to implementing a SQL driver. I haven't finished formulating all my thoughts on that, uh, but, you know, we'll get, we're working on it. So, how do we run a query against the table people? Um, what we're going to do is do a git, uh, we're, uh, oh. next slide. All right. Uh, this didn't line up quite the way I was hoping it would. But so what we're doing is selecting star from people, all right? And then we have a for loop that iterates over all the people. Okay, so this is going to be matching the first key in our database, which was the uh, last name. Yeah, which was the last name. Somebody made a typo here. He's a bad person. Uh, and then we're going to iterate over the next item in our database, starting with the subscript that we know. So we have two for loops here, and we iterate over the, the entire series of the database and yield first name, last name, and the actual value of the person. So this is us getting a value. And when we yield it, what we actually do for now is put it into a new temporary table uh, so that when you have embedded SQL commands, we can still look at data as we're doing it. We can look at the result of SQL commands in SQL commands. Does this make sense? Sort of, kind of, a little bit. Uh, one thing to note here is it requires two for loops. Right? So the cost of this is going to be O times, uh, ON times N, where N is the number of first names and M is the number of last names for each first name. It's a relatively expensive operation. Right? If we add something like limiting it to the case where the last name is Sanchez, one of the things we can do with the audit EV that makes this pretty easy is when we generate the mumps code, we just say last name equals Sanchez rather than doing that for them. And so now we are just doing iterations over the total number of people of first names with the last name Sanchez. And then we yield the data. And this is a equijoin optimization. There's a few other types of optimizations you can do for less than and greater than, limiting the range. Um, you do have to select the <coughs> order in which you're iterating through your table when you do it that way. But okay. So here's a question. That worked super well when uh, last name was part of the key value, the key that I was using to get to the value. What about the case where we're trying to add a condition uh, on something that isn't part of the key? And interestingly, this is kind of the number one use case for Octo. Because if you just want to get you know, all the Sanchez's, you can just write a quick little dirty program to do it for you, and it's super easy. But when you have to start thinking about iterating through all of those names to find the one guy who's alive, that sounds like a lot of work. Uh, and then there's the performance aspect of it. Of now you have to search through everything. 
So what we do, um, we do have, you know, this option, and I think in, in Postgres you would call this case a index. Uh, but option A is you just iterate through all those things, and when you find a value that is matching what you're looking for, you store it into the output table. Performance on that is abysmal, so what we do is we generate a cross-reference. As I said, I think Postgres calls that a index, where we store things in a kind of inverted form. Is that, is that that's a temporary thing? It's um, to be determined. Uh, for the data sets that we're looking at, these cross-references end up being large enough that you don't want to just throw them out. But they're not so large that the disk space they use seems to be a problem. What we'll probably end up doing is allowing it to be configurable uh, for the lifetime. And then there's other, the other thing we haven't really figured out is if you do a select on a select, so a, a recursive select, do we create a cross-reference for that temporary thing? We haven't really decided yet. It's a work in progress. Uh, so here's an example of a select statement. We're going to look for all the people that are alive. What we do is we construct a cross-reference. For now, we store it in a global called cross-reference, uh, table name, and then we have the, the thing that the cross-reference is for. So for example, true. And then each of the keys from the table as a second argument to that. And then you just loop through that exactly as you would loop through uh, the table. Uh, to maintain this, YadaDB has a notion of triggers. So when we insert another piece of data, we can automatically update the keys. And these triggers will get fired even if you insert the data from something other than SQL. So, you know, they're, they're a useful feature to have. Any questions on uh, that? Okay. But so do, do you like So you haven't determined yet if these cross-references always exist. Like there could be so many types of cross-references that you might want, right? Right. So the, the current behavior is that it generates a cross-reference when it gets a query for it. Our theory is that generally people will be running the same query often. So once you have the cross-references, you will rerun that query. We will probably give you an option to, well, you could right now delete the cross-reference at any point manually. Um, because the database isn't hidden behind some opaque wall and stored in a data file format, you can access it using your favorite language and just go through and delete cross-references you don't like. Um, we do have a command line utility to pretty easily perform database operations, like deleting things and setting values manually and jazz like that. Um, right now, uh, after cross-reference is created, it hangs around. As I mentioned, we're still pretty early on in development. We're in alpha. So we have a lot of things working. We have some customers getting ready to deploy us and telling us what else they need, but we're, we're young. As we get better answers, we will implement them. OK? So now we get to the more interesting stuff. Um, joins, uh, these tend to kind of be the reason that SQL optimization is hard. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to create another table. Uh, and this is also where we get our relational part. Note that uh, for now, because you can't do inserts with Octo, the key attributes, or like the, the foreign key constraint that you will often see in Postgres doesn't apply. You can type it in there because you can't insert data. Postgres won't, in, where, uh, because you can't insert data, Octo will never have an opportunity to enforce that relationship. Uh, and it's up to you as you're writing your no SQL logic to ensure that you're behaving correctly. So we're going to create a table called Morty. It'll have a primary uh, ID, primary key, just one, two, three, four, five, six. It's auto increment. We'll have, a, uh, we'll have the foreign key, which is a composite key, pointing to a, a other person, be the last name and first name, and then we'll have an indication as to whether or not the Morty is alive. All right. So, let's try this. Select star from people, P1, cross join, Morty's M1. You end up with a, uh, a loop that has three for statements in it. That's, that's a lot of for statements, yes? That's uh, M times N times P or something. It's pretty expensive. And it produces a lot of rows. 
So what we usually do is we apply a condition to it. We'll say where the Morty we're looking for is the Morty belonging to whoever this person is. All right? So now we just have one for loop. And now our join has a relational component with almost no penalty on performance. Right? I think I'm going to torture you guys a little bit. So, from people, P1 cross join Morty M1, where P1 dot first name equals M1 dot first name and P1 dot last name equals M1 dot last name. I get a typo? What typo did I make? I don't know. It's not worth it. We're just going to hit backspace a bunch of times. Rick first name? Hmm? Is it supposed to be Rick first name? Rick what? Is it the right uh, column name? Oh, <clears throat> I don't know. We'll, we'll do my normal one. Oh. Names cross join oh. from names and one cross join names and two. Okay. So we can see we have output here. Uh, I did switch things up on you guys again, names is my current testing database that I use. We did a cross join, we got a ton of output. What I'm going to show you is how that gets rendered into our physical plant. So somebody had asked about how it looks when we render the mumps. Um, can we see that okay? I don't know how to make it bigger. So uh, the mumps file we generate uh, looks kind of like this. And you'll see there are, each of these dots represents one depth of looping, so we can get an idea for the cost of this operation. All right, what we're going to do really quick is add a condition to it. Inner join names and two. I'm going to borrow that window really quick. I hope everybody's okay with that. One minute. see it okay so we added a condition verifying that the IDs of our two people match and now if we look at the generated mumps file we'll be able to see that an optimization took place and we will only have one level of looping right which is exactly what we hope to see this is a very simple optimization I can't imagine database not doing this unfortunately this may shock you some SQL engines built for these NoSQL databases don't do this. All right, so this is a, a problem where we have engines for NoSQL databases that have 1980s era or less optimization engines. It's not good.
Okay, pressing on. All right, all right, all right. Okay, um, so one of the other things we have in SQL, which is pretty important, is uh, set operations. You also see these a lot in, uh, what's it called? Uh, relational algebra. So union, intersect, except, minus. What, that last one has, I guess, a bunch of names. Except, difference, minus, one of them. It's something like that. Uh, unions are the easiest. You basically just do one select statement, do one statement, and then paste onto the end of it the, uh, the other one, uh, removing duplicates. Right, so that makes it a little bit harder, but with Yada DB, super easy because we store things in a output table, which is maintained in our uh, hierarchical key value store. So as long as the keys match, we know there's data there. We just don't put the, the duplicate in, and we're done. Right? Uh, we do have to maintain a cross reference. Uh, the I don't know what the standard says, but I think most people kind of have an expected order that they expect the database to retrieve results in. A natural ordering, if you will. So we want to make sure we enforce that ordering. So we use a cross-reference to, uh, you know, make things come out in the right order. Uh, intersect in, finds all the rows which exist in both tables one and table two. Uh, removing duplicates again. For us, in Octo, in Yada DB, this is not a challenge, right? We just, again, store in our database. And then we go through it the second time. Uh, as we iterate through the table, we also iterate through our results and remove anything that we don't find, right? Or, sorry, we, we copy anything we do find from the uh, temporary table that was the output of the first one to a new temporary table, which is our actual output. So it has to be in both in order to actually be outputted. And uh, except you go through, you construct your output table, you go through your second table, and you just delete anything that you find that existed in the output table. Any questions on those three set operations? OK. Now the fun stuff. Outer joins. Uh, these are some of the more costly SQL expressions you can do. If you do them on the wrong table, on the wrong database, you will get a lot of rows. You will crash the system and make your DBA very sad. Right? Uh, so as an example, or before we get to an example, the, the, uh, the, the outer join types that you have, you have a left join, which takes all the values from the left table and matches them up with the values in the right table. If there are no values in the right table, it just puts a null row. The right join swaps that around. The full outer join is the problem. It uh, selects all the ones here and all the ones here and matches them up. And if you don't have a match in either one, you still add it to the end and you put a bunch of nulls on either side. Right? Full outer join creates a lot of rows. Not as bad as cross join, but still quite a bit. Um, so to do this, the, the way that it's usually thought about in most of the literature that I've read is you think of it as a set operation. So what you do is you take the intersection of table one and table two for the left join. Take the intersection of table one and table two. All right, so now you have the values that match. And then you do a union with the data in table one, removing the data that you already have. So now you get the remainder. And that's how you do a outer join. All right? Performance-wise, um, I haven't yet figured out what kind of optimizations I can do there. Did I see a hand? No? OK. Um, we're working on it. The other type of joins we have, inner joins, natural joins, uh, what these are basically doing is it's a cross join with a condition. We saw the equi join optimization happen. You do that again and again. Uh, and that's, that's how you handle the joins. Some problems we have that we are still working on, and this is something that literature has solved a while ago, but implementation sometimes follows at a bit of a lag. Uh, it's wonderful if you have a SQL expression that's a bunch of joins, because then it's n equals m, and b equals c, and d equals f. That's all fine and dandy. 
you just pick which keys or which, which uh, indexes you're going to fix to reduce the number of loops that you have to do, right? However, when we add an or into that mess, we end up with a big, big fuddle, right? Uh, and I think the way this is normally handled in most of the databases and engines out there is they merge the results of two separate queries together and then produce an answer. Does anybody know if that's true? That's true. Excellent. Not too far from the truth. So we intend to do something very much like that, and that's also where you can do your um, parallelism, right? And it's one of the places where a lot of the literature has kind of started to indicate you can do more clever optimization techniques. Um, there's things called eddies. There's a volcano method thing that goes in there. All kinds of fun stuff you can do. And I appear to have this slide twice. Okay, so um, this is the last slide. And I don't know how long I've talked for. Long enough, I suppose. Um, Takeaway, or the, 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 the thing we're at now, uh, optimizing SQL queries is MP hard. We have some heuristics we're hoping to use. Um, conveniently, our cross-references that I talked about earlier that we use for even the most basic of optimization because, uh, because of the way YadaDB is organizes its data, it's trivial to store both a counter of the number of like last names that have the name Sanchez, along with the number of keys uh, that, that belong to that. Uh, so our cross-reference table works exactly like a heuristic kind of uh, statistic storage thing, where we can try and pick which items to prioritize based on how common they are in the database. Even so, we won't get perfect answers, but we will get answers. Um, for comparison, I think that uh, Postgres does something similar. I know that when you get to really large things, they start to use a genetic algorithm to optimize, select the optimizations to take and where to apply them. We're still working on exactly how we're going to do it. Um, Questions? Yes? Well, what's the difference between a, what do you call it, a, a cross join and an inner join? Uh, I, I, I saw you use cross join, yeah, so but, but I've never seen cross join used in SQL ever. Oh, exciting stuff. Uh, cross join is inner join. Oh, okay. Cross join is kind of your most basic operation. It produces a table of size n times n. Inner join is a cross join with a condition added to it. And the okay. condition is that the, uh, uh, well, you know the on clause you can do with, with an inner join? Yeah. That's the condition. Okay. That's all inner joins are, are cross joins with a Boolean condition. Uh, what's the difference between a cross join and a full outer join then? So those are entirely different. Um, outer joins, um, where, where cross joins, you, you pair them up directly, kind of, I guess. I guess. That's not really a good way of saying it. But, but with no condition? Well, yes. Cross join has no condition, right? The outer join, um, you take all from this side and you, you grab it from that side if you can. I, I guess you could add a uh, or statement in there, maybe. Is that what you're asking? Okay. No, so our, our the outer join requires that you have a condition because then that's how you identify the rows that don't match. The cross join has no condition at all and matches every row against every other row. Okay. Yep. I think it's a full outer. No, I guess you're right. You do need to know the key that it maps to in the other table. Yeah. The syntax doesn't allow you not yeah. to find it. You have to. <laughs> Glad you're here. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Um, so again, uh, you can find us on GitLab. You just Google YadaDB. We have links to all this stuff. We're a fully open source company. Uh, we are learning. I am relatively inexperienced, I suppose. I just came out of school a few months ago. So please help me figure out what's what. Teach me how it's done. Um, and we're open to contributors. And we, we really do like talking with people. So stop by our booth and keep us company. Yeah. Hack the planet. Hmm? Hack the planet. Hack the planet.
<clears throat> oh yeah. There were like three hacker themed things. Oh, you saw my names. That's why you're saying that. Oh yeah. For those of you I was who wearing that shirt yesterday, <laughs> who, who missed out on it, my sample data set uh, is all the main names from the uh, wonderful 1995 film Hackers. There's Zero Cool, Acid Burn, Serial Killer, Lord Nikon, and Joey, the man who doesn't have a name. No name, man. I think we should have watched that last night instead of War Games. Yeah. Have you heard of an ancient one called the Pick Database? The what? The Pick Database. The Pick Database? No, is that a movie or is that no, a... No, uh, that's a... Uh, my, my first tech job, I got stuck working with a NoSQL database that was pre-Pascal, and it was 2004. <laughs> nice. With its own crappy language called Pick Basic. Huh. And old school programmers that insisted the proper way to learn this was was to use the line editor, and then when, when they think you're ready, they'll give you the GUI in Windows. <laughs> But the line editor was not even VI. It was so old that you had to regex everything to even change a typo. Oh, <laughs> no, thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you for listening to me, Rand. And I. <laughs>